All right, my friends, we are here on Friday, 5.30 Eastern time on 9-11, <gasps> which is a, an amazing thing in itself that we're here on this it. day. Um, I want to do a nice uh, virtual press event with Marantz. They just came out with a 30 series integrated amp and SACD network player. Very exciting to hear about these products. Um, I've been a longtime Marantz fan myself as an audiophile, audioholic. So we've got some of the top brass here from Marantz, and I want to kind of let them run through this PowerPoint presentation to give you guys a background of the company, the direction that they're heading, and just a rundown of the products, and then maybe like a little brief Q&A section here uh, towards the end. So without further ado, I think we're going to start with Joel on this. Yeah, thanks, Gene. Thanks for having us. Before we get going, I'd love to introduce my counterparts here, Emmanuel Malo is our technical category leader for Sound United, Hi-Fi specifically, and he's been really driving the whole Morantz program for the last couple of years now. We've got Phil Jones, who's also our director of training and has been instrumental in building not only a, uh, a compelling go-to-market plan, but also making sure that you know we have all the right uh, ingredients to, to make sure retail and to make sure that these products sell on the shelf. So it's great. Good, glad to have them with us here. Awesome. Great. So let's get this PowerPoint thing up so we could kind of see what's going on here. I'm going to share the screen here. All right. Thanks. Awesome. So uh, we thought by, you know, before introducing uh, the Model 30 and the SACD 30, and we talk a little bit about what we're trying to achieve with Morant. Sometimes it's helpful contextually to know where we're going. So what we have here is uh, really just an introduction to the brand. And I think most audiophiles know the story of Saul Morantz and how we founded the company. It's near and dear to our heart. And anyone who still uh, is, is working on the behalf of Morantz, our history continues to inspire us day in and day out. It's Saul's original mission about bringing the most musical and the best, most realistic reproduction to market. That's really what we're trying to achieve. That continues to inspire us day in and day out. And, um, the products that we're announcing in the market this week or this the last few weeks, the Model 30 and the SACD 30N are a testament to, to that original founding. When Sound United acquired Denon and Marantz back in 2017, previous to that, it was just Polk and Definitive Technology. We entered into an agreement to acquire Denon and Marantz. And at that time, we talked to a lot of dealers and a lot of customers about how they viewed Marantz, how they viewed Denon, what they felt were the strengths, what Oh, very clear cool. that there was a big opportunity for Marantz to move up market, to actually go back and re-embrace our history in maybe a more meaningful way. So in 2017, over three years ago, we started this work uh, in earnest. We started to actually uh, invest not only in um, new industrial design, new products, but also in a new brand identity. And that work began in 2017 and the Model 30 and the SACD 30N are really the first products um, uh, with this work in mind. So you can go to the next slide. When we started that work in 2017, we concluded very quickly that we have such a legacy, such a strong heritage that we wanted to go back and better understand some of the more signature elements of our products. Not even just the signature design elements, but also how they made people feel, how the logo was treated, some of the more iconic pieces that you see across the PM10 all the way back to the Model 9, Model 7C. And we centered very quickly on a handful of design elements that uh, Simon, who just joined us, will actually be able to speak to in a bit as well. But as we've said all along, we want to embrace our history. We just want to modernize it for a, for a new generation as well as for our core customers. And so that's what we're really talking about today. It's much more than just new design and new products. We also have a new brand proposition. Modern musical luxury are three words that are very meaningful to us because I think they represent really what we're trying to do with Marantz. It's, it is a heritage brand, but it's a brand that we feel can be modernized and be relevant for new consumers, consumers who maybe are much more uh, apt to be streaming music customers, maybe they're younger customers in some ways. And I think this is something that Marantz needs to continue to embrace and sort through. Musical, the center word in our brand, 
is certainly near and dear to our heart. We mentioned that already, that music continues to be uh, the, the heartbeat of, of the Morant's brand and will continue to be for the years to come. And luxury, I think to me, this represents all of the adjacent consumer touch points that we have to be better thinking about. It's not just the, the physical product experience, it's the user experience, it's the remote control, it's the packaging, it's all of these things that add up to creating that emotion and creating that feeling for the brand. And so I think these three words together really represent the proposition that we're pursuing. We're moving Morant's up market, we're embracing our heritage and modernizing for, for new customers as well, uh, while not forgetting about our past. Go to the next slide, Phil. So we're thrilled to present uh, to your viewers, Gene, the new Model 30 and the new SACD 30N. Uh, the Model 30 is an integrated stereo amplifier that Emmanuel is going to take us through all the nuts and bolts and the performance that he's built into this product. It's an amazing product, and it sets a new benchmark for us at this price point. The SACD 30N, as he's going to talk about in a bit, is also an amazing new product. It's a hybrid SACD player and a networked audio player combination piece. So this stack together is the Model 30 and SACD 30N. And if you're paying attention, you see that we're going back to embracing the nomenclature model in our names. Um, you know, it, it's very clear that we have an opportunity to not just again represent our history in the products, but also represent it in things like the model name and how we actually lay out our assortment of products. So we're thrilled to present these products to, uh, to our fans and, uh, and viewers. It's a very symmetric design. Was that done intentionally? Well, that's a great segue. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> that's a great segue uh, that we're showing Phil's screen right now, and he's actually got the stack right there in his house. Um, Phil, if you don't mind going back to the screen, I'd, I'd love to hand it over to Simon. I, I think we've talked a bit about the context around it, but you can actually go back a slide if you don't mind. Um, Simon is our vice president of industrial design. He spent a ton of energy on making sure all the all the nuts and bolts of these product and the way that they feel uh, is exactly what we're looking to do. So I'd like to turn it over to him to actually take us through maybe a level deeper on the design around these products. Yeah, thanks, Joel. Um, you mentioned symmetry there, and that, like I said, that was a great, great segue. One of the things that um, we did, we can go to the next slide, Phil, that'd be great, thank you. Um, one of the things that we did was sort of reach back, as Joel was saying, into the history of that and honor that sort of 70 years legacy of, of just phenomenal products and experiences, but also be honorific to that, but be thoroughly modern in our approach. We didn't just want to have a retrospective and reintroduce that. Um, the, the Model 30 starts is representing a start of a whole new, what we'd call a design language. And if you look back at the history of our products, there are generations of of what we call design languages, look and feels, but they all share common attributes. And, and one of those was, was symmetry. And um, we just love this image because it's a lovely old image of um, piano tuner, but the, you know, just sort of capture that sort of time distance. This guy's got a cigarette in his hands. We never realized that <laughs> until we sort of used yep. the image. And it was just great, you know. So um, if we go to the next slide, you know, when we talk about this sort of design DNA um, in the products, there are like key elements, obviously, the brand itself is the number one central element um, that we need to uh, you know, focus on and centralize in the product. And that's something that we want to honor and put front and center. Um, one of the things, the way we've treated it, we've left it alone. We've not sort of put a model name under it. We've given it the sort of um, honor and the space it requires in the product and centrally placed it. And it's treated in this beautiful champagne. You'll see that on uh, Champagne Gold and all the products. Uh, we go to the next slide. And we just we just talked about this, but I think it's emblematic of our approach to the you know audio engineering as well as the mechanical engineering and the design all coming together to create this sense of symmetry. And you know, as Joel was saying, it takes an extraordinary amount of effort to get that kind of symmetry in a product. You can imagine the trade-off between mechanical engineer, designer, acoustic engineer. I mean, even the placement of a screw sometimes can affect the uh, audio performance of these products. So all this has to be absolutely sort of um, gone to the next level of depth as we as we execute them. Um, go to the next slide. One of the things you see us emphasizing as we go forward is, you know, it's this is such an iconic element of the history of Morantz that we, you know, there's always a challenge in the digital age of do you, 
you know, do you move on from this? Do you change this? It, what we felt is we wanted to reinforce the feeling of the, the iconic porthole. And for us, the this is as much um, an icon to us as I would say the watch face for Rolex or a Panerai. And so you'll see us um, emphasize that, centrally position it, and continue to use it both as a digital element and as a, a design feature and mechanical element going forward. So what does that porthole indicate? What does that meter on? What does it show in the user? That one there is an old classic one. We just want to show the history. That's a, an old VU meter. But we actually want to be using um, uh, on our products. It will be the focal point of the, the uh, interaction. Mm -hmm. So in the future, this will be, um, that's it. Thank you. It will show. Uh, <laughs> Can you focus in on that at all? Show the, the way it's reading? Uh, I, 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 unfortunately, I, it'd be difficult for me to do that, but that actually okay, right yeah, now yeah. is showing my volume no, 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 and what feel. source I'm actually playing. Yeah, so yeah. that's so, what's actually going on. That'll right be now. a key interaction on it going forward. Yeah. Um, well, that'll have the, the key information that you'll need on there. Um, the other thing you'll see that in the history, and we talk a lot in design of form follows function, and while this is very functional, uh, I always draw the analogy to, you know, the easiest way is cars. Like, you know, a Volkswagen will get you from A to B just as well as a Bentley, but it'll give you a very different experience. So, you know, one of the things we have in here is a very sort of rich use of materials and texture and lighting. And now lighting and interaction through light has always been part of the Marantz history. And that's something we wanted to sort of double down on in the, the experience. And you can see here the sort of complex interaction of light and form, which was something we want to give these a sort of breathing ambience and light to them um, in use. And um, I think Phil, as you can attest to, sat there with a scotch at night with just this on it. It's, it's, it seems to sort of fit the trait. You know. yeah. And I think also we, we spent a lot of time tuning that LED light. So it has that sort of almost like a, a tube amp kind of warmth and glow to it as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Um, and you can see here this sort of sense of proportion line, which Moran's products have always had. And I think that's something we want to attest to. There's always been this symmetrical break, very clean, uh, understandable um, uh, outlay of controls and features on the product. So we wanted to keep that there as well. Um, and I think the other thing to add is the use of materials. We use uh, you know, high-grade um, aluminum. We use uh, aluminum in the, um, the all the uh, controls are weighted, and they have a really smooth action, a very precise action. That's something we want to get into the experience. Um, as well as here, you see the porthole becoming the key area where the interaction happens. And we've reserved the, um, there's so much rich heritage to draw on with um, with Marantz. Um, we spent a lot of time in the museum in Shirakao with all the old products. Um, that some elements we have to decide where and how to use them. And Joel spoke, you know, beautifully how we're reusing the model names. Also the, the star motif is being used as the digital element now on the products rather than a physical element on the products. So um, look for more uh, detail on that going forward with your languages. So I think that really covers the industrial design for now. So quick question for you on that porthole when you saw the star <laughs> kind of icon on it, was that is that something that happens during power up? Do you see that graphic or is that just a, a mm -hmm. yeah. Is that, yeah. is that real or is that just photo? Uh, like yes. a rendering. Yes, that's, no, that's real. <laughs> that's real. Yeah. yeah, you've done this before. Yeah. I can it, tell. Like, <laughs> is yeah. that a mock-up or a real one? Yeah. Yeah, that's yes, real. Yes, it is. It, is, it does happen doing power up. Um, and like I said, he, when he mentioned that warmth of it, it is nice to look at the glow that comes off of it because this thing is sitting a lot of times front and center. There's a pride of ownership to having these products. Mm -hmm. I mean, the reason why we're in my room right now is I didn't want to disconnect this and put it on a shelf because I am literally playing this thing uh, <laughs> right after we get done with this um, and enjoying my weekend. So. It, so, it's, so it's, Gene, it's beautiful to have <laughs> Gene, I can add also there. So, and actually, feel if you do it when you power on the two product together, they synchronize. So they both right. have to start at the same time, and the whole yeah. boot up yeah. process is fully synchronized across the two units. So, gotcha. Okay. Yeah, it's a, it's beautiful. I mean, yeah. I gotta really give nice. Simon a high five. <laughs> so I gotta put you. I gotta. I, I gotta put you guys on the spot about one thing. Is there any way? That there could that all that LED backlighting could be changed to blue because blue is always like associated <laughs> with high end, you know. That's like the uh, yeah. Actually, do you want to no, talk about that? I'll take, yeah, I'll okay. take that. Yeah, we we did actually investigate that, and we do. In fact, I have a model behind me. I can't show you that has the blue tuning in it. So we we did have a sort of bipolar switch between the blue. Um, we decided for other reasons not to do that. Um, one of the main reasons that we started to steer Marantz away from blue. And it's still in the heritage we may use it again is that 
the use of blue in consumer electronics has been really cheapened. Right? When we started using blue, I mean, I have an old printer, I have a little printer behind me with a blue LED. Blue LEDs used to be extremely expensive um, to use. And as they became more popular, the price of those dropped. And we almost see it sort of overused in every sort of cheap car hi-fi and everything. And it just, it didn't seem synergist with the brand at this point. Um, but it's something we may return to um, mm -hmm. in the future. All right, let me put back the slide presentation. Here we go. I mean, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. Come on. Yeah, I'd say the other thing we spent a lot of time on is the the, the actual colors, the, the CMF on this, as we call it, color material finishes, is, you know, the, the paints and the materials and the anodization of that aluminum. You know, there's a, there's a warmth to it. There's you know, thousands of specks of different <laughs> different blacks you can get to and, and champagnes and things. So that was you know, very carefully engineered. And you'll notice on the side of the box, there's no screws. The whole yes. thing is clean. Um, yeah. yeah. And, this is and then also the remote. I mean, I mean, even the finish of the remote, this is this is a nice thing to hold. And I was just looking at this when I took it out of the box. The colors and everything else is just it's just a beautiful um, thing to look at. It's got heft to it as well, which is yes, you know, yeah, it's good weight in those. Gene, do you have the device there? Have you experienced it in person? No, I don't have these. I I, I come from the background um, in terms of two channel Marantz. Um, I had the PM eleven S two and the PM eleven S three. I love those. That's that's what really got me into vinyl, and we'll talk a little bit more about that when you yeah. talk about that section, but. Mm -hmm my i was always skeptical about vinyl and then i said you know what i got these incredible reference speakers everybody's talking about vinyl still it's become kind of a posh thing so yeah. i started buying some records and i got the pm um the tt 15 s1 turntable from moran uh -huh. i love that thing and, yeah, and since i got that set up i have a guy that works for us named xavier he's the doctor analog and he is obsessed <laughs> with vinyl and he came and spent three hours tuning and balancing that thing and it just this, the experience is stunning if you get a good record. And the fact that the preamp section on the PM11 S3, the, the phono section on that, which I measured and I have measurements we could talk about later, was just stellar. I mean, it was just a great experience. So that that sold me on kind of the Marantz two-channel aspects yeah. of the brand. Then you'll love this. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's a great segue to Emmanuel. <laughs> yeah. Presentation. Yeah, can you go to the next slide? So yeah, so I'm, I'm going to introduce you the product a little bit more in the detail and talk about the, the specification of the product. But before we, we dig into all those technical specification and everything, I just wanted to share that picture with you. So this is a, a picture of one of the listening room and that we have in Japan. And actually the gentleman you see sitting in the chair there in front of you and staring at you a little bit is actually the Maron Sound Master. So uh, you saw from the new proposition that music all is at the center of the proposition. And before that, it was because music matter. And, and this is what's important for us and always been important for the brand. That's how it started initially. That was uh, the, the journey that Soul B Marons was on. Initially, it was not trying to do a business. It was just trying to find the perfect reproduction device for his own use. And, and when he developed that in his kitchen, he was really happy about that. And then his friend came and they asked him for a new unit or whatever. So it's always been about the passion of reproducing music and that's why we we always define it as the most musical sound and everything we do so of course we measure the product and of course uh, we we take a lot of time but we tune those product and i really like this word there <laughs> so, I'm sorry, yeah, that, i love that, that. that too, that's too funny that's too funny i'm sorry emmanuel please, please just, uh, i'm sorry i interrupted you but that was too funny. that's okay <laughs> I was wondering what was happening there. <laughs> That's great. I have to ask, what is the deal with that not that braided cable? Man, that looks like that that could run, you know, the DeLorean from Back to the Future. <laughs> yeah. So you know, we 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 just wanted to make sure that when we test and we we'll listen to those products, you you're not listening or. Uh, uh, to any of, you know, if you use cheap cable or whatever, you're not listening to any part of that, that you really have the, the purest distribution of the signal as possible. So I, don't ask me the brand of those cable. I don't know. Uh, but I, I know that they have pretty good equipment in it's that like room to do that. zero-gauge cable there. Yeah, I know. It's massive. It's massive. So, and, and 
Basically, what's important there on that picture is that no matter which product, which price point we're doing, no product will be released until the sound master validate the product. And you're probably familiar, uh, if you know about Bronx, that we're using what we call the HM, Hyper Dynamic Amplifier Module, which is our own way of creating and replacing the small IC chipset, where we can almost end select each of the parts we're using on those boards. And that's our way to tune the sound. So I just wanted to share that uh, because I think this is something that 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 it did exist from the start. And those sound masters, they spend countless hours just making sure that those products sound right. And, and there's a long tradition around that. And Nogada San that you see on the picture have been trained more or less 10 years by the previous uh, uh, Sawada San uh, sound master. And this is how the tradition is keeping. So yes, measurement is important, but I would say also the uh, the emotion of the music reproduction is all. Yeah, I was just going to add something else to the picture, Emmanuel. Like people pick up on the old computer in the corner. And so, it, <laughs> <laughs> so I, think it, I think it's a really old photograph. It, that's there because it just runs one kind of software. It doesn't exist in any other one. Yeah. Uh, picture, yeah. like, runs, runs on copies. And it's the best software and it's the only play to, play to use it. So yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah it, it is not a picture for 10 years ago. Exactly, years ago. Exactly. It is a picture that is really, really uh, yeah. uh, recent. So, yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, let's go to a, a little bit more of the specification of the product uh, there. Um, so, basically, talking about the Model 30, so it is a pure analog amplifier. So, but if you look at it, it's basically almost a two in one, right? And and we'll talk about that a little bit later on the next slide. So you have a, a pre-amplifier and an amplifier in, in the same box, and they really treat as two separate part of the product, uh, which is really, really important with independent uh, power supply uh, and, and really, really short signal path uh, in between them. Uh, we will talk also a little bit about the uh, phono. So you touch base on that. Uh, so we have a, a phono input MC, uh, MC and MM on that product. And, and we actually went back to the drawing board of the phono. Uh, it is actually interesting to see that the interest of uh, for phono uh, and NLP reproduction is growing. So and, and looking and studying that whole market again and looking into that, we realized that there's been a, a lot of progress that happened in the last 10 to 15 years there. There's a lot of new type of cartridge. So uh, we we had that uh, inputs uh, uh, impedance selection there because we realized that not all the cartridge that you can buy today work the same way. So in order to have the best possible reproduction, we had that. So and and I will I will show you that to you in a bit more detail. Uh, so we also have a DC cobalt volume uh, stage. Uh, so we're not using any uh, capacitor there or whatever. So also to preserve uh, the purity of the signal there. Uh, we have a lot of power in that amplifier. So we have two times 100 watt into eight ohm or two times 200 watt into four ohm. And yeah, I touch base on that about the um, no matter all the number, whatever, there is that aspect of, you know, uh, that, that mount sound uh, that people are referring to and which is really what the, the, the mount sound master are there to keep. Um, even if, of course, you want to make sure that an amplifier is bringing as minimum coloration as possible, you really want to hear the speaker. But there is still, a, I would say, an opening, a 3D sound that Mons is really well known for that we want to preserve and make sure it is there. So you really have that really, really wide stage where you're listening to so if you go to, if we look at the next slide, so there is basically here, um, I put a picture so you can look at what's inside the product. And if you remember that today, I was, uh, today, before, sorry about that, I was mentioning about two product in one and you see it there. So what you have there on the right side, it is the pre-amplifier module. And as I mentioned before, so we're using what we call the HDAM. So there is no IC chipset there. Everything is made out of a, a discrete passive component that we can tune and select the way we want. And the power supply, the linear power supply you see uh, below uh, the product, the picture there, uh, which is using a toroidal transformer, is actually the power supply for the preamp section, uh, just to make it clear. Uh, in the top part, in the center, you have the two uh, power amplifier module. If you look at that, you will see that they directly connect to the speaker terminal. Uh, this ensure really a super short signal path. There is no cable running in, in the amplifier between the uh, uh, the amplifier module and the preamp that can, you know, mixing high current and low current uh, could be dangerous sometimes for noise level and all of that. So by this design, having the power amp directly connect to the speaker terminal, you really 
avoid that. There is no better way of, of doing it. And next to that, you had the SMPS power supply uh, for, uh, actually this power supply is for the power amp. Um, on the side also there on the right, you see a picture of that uh, dedicated uh, phono stage, which is actually located below the preamp uh, board, so you don't see it on the picture. And because here you even into lower, I would say, uh, voltage than the preamp, we also shelled that phono stage uh, by itself and, and place it under the preamp. So a lot of attention to those details just to ensure the best and the most musical sound possible. So basically like you're dealing to. This is basically separates in one box, is what you're Yes, it is. Show. It is basically a two in one in one box, right? Can you go to the next slide, Phil? So this is a picture of the back of the amplifier. So as I mentioned earlier, it is a 100 percent um, analog amplifier, so there is no digital input there. Uh, there is um, a pre-out uh, and there is also a, a direct in. So if you want to use that amplifier with, let's say, an AV8805 uh, from Rance as an AVR and use that just as a power amplifier, you can do that using that power amp in. So you're bypassing completely um, the preamp section in that case. Uh, and you see also that the phone puts. Nice. So I, I just want to do one quick comment on the back panel of that product. And it says power consumption, 150 Watts. I'm actually going to do a separate video on this. That's not a max power rating. Just so no, people, yeah. I know people keep asking that on YouTube and I'm going to do a whole video on this. Cause we, I kind of went back and forth with Dan and engineers. And now I know how this is rated. It's rated at a much lower power. And then the amplifier efficiencies actually consume more power as a result. And they come up with this number. Um, but we'll talk about that separate. Just I don't want anyone to say, hey, this is a 200 watt amplifier and it says 150 on the back panel. Yes. And the other, the other thing you can see there and that I forgot to mention earlier uh, is that product is made in Japan. Uh, so we have our uh, factory in Shirakawa uh, that uh, Simon mentioned about before. So this is where we, we're manufacturing that product, which is also um, a, a great way when you're in the tuning process and in the engineering process of a product that if you want to test and different component or whatever, it made the whole thing much easier uh, at the end. So. so quick question for you on the PM 11 S three that I used to have, there was a button on the front where you could turn off the power amp section and just use it as a preamp. Does that, does this one have that feature too, or, do, or are the speaker terminals always active, even if you use it as a preamp? So it's always active, even if you use it as a preamp. Okay. Yeah, you don't have that feature. Uh, here also, I want to make a quick stop. So I'm, I, I touched on that earlier, whatever. So we, we kind of look back in, into the market and all the different cartridges which are available there. And we realize the fact that um, with new generation cartridges which are available, no, we realize that generally the impedance of those new cartridges is much higher than the older generation ones. So basically you're... I would say all the generation and don't take that wrong in that way. I would say uh, that I've been design and engineer a uh, yeah, long time ago. Uh, I have a pretty low impedance and the more modern one, the more new one like Clio is using is of a much higher impedance. Our own cartridge, which is the, the, done for the DR103, which is one of the product we've been manufacturing for the Longest there is also in kind of the, the meat impedance section with 100 home. So we wanted to make sure that no matter the type of cartridge you're using, you really get back that whole dynamic you may have, because if you have a high impedance cartridge and you put that as a low imp uh, impedance input, then you, you're going to lose some of that dynamic there in the whole process. So by having that, um, I would say impedance selection, you can really get the maximum out of your own cartridge. And I mentioned that before uh, we really went back to the drawing board for that that phono input and and we we'll look at it at the, probably that 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 was a, a section that you know we were carry on for a long time uh, and use it product after product which was a pretty amazing phono input but that new generation one was really going back to that drawing board and and really really looking into the way it was almost done 20 or 30 years ago and trying to bring that back into a modern product so it is a i really encourage people that because there's been a lot of passion and engineering that went into that phono stage. So two quick questions about the phono. Um, one is if you have a Marantz TT 15 S one, which mm -hmm. as far as I know is the only turntable that Marantz is producing right now, 
what setting would you use on for this amplifier? And then are you guys planning on releasing more turntables through the Marantz brand now that you have a product like this? So the answer for the um, TT15S1 is to go on the high because it's, um, it's we're using a clear audio cartridge on that product. So it's basically there. And, and I will defer probably to Joel to answer to the second part of the question. Yeah, I mean, we have a lot of interest in uh, in this part of the industry, turntables. We definitely have a history. So I think it's something we're absolutely looking at in the years to come. Great. Any other? So here, I just also wanted to touch base on, so we having a switching amplifier in the model, but um, we have been spending a lot of time working on that mode. And it's actually not a new module for us. It is actually the same one that is used, for example, in the PM10, uh, which is our um, super high end premium amplifier at the moment, which is a fully balanced amplifier and use four of those amplifier modules in the Model 30, you only have two of them. Uh, but what was important for us is was also with typical switching amplifier generally what happened is your frequency response is is really changing according to the impedance of uh, the speaker you're connecting in the in the back of the amplifier and it had coloration to the sound and you're not really listening to the speaker any longer but that you're more listening to the amplifier uh, and we wanted to make sure that we avoid that. So one of the things we did uh, and engineering did in the whole process of working on that module was to introduce that feedback loop with a low pass filter that really controlled that frequency response, no matter the type of the uh, speaker you're using. And the real benefit of that at the end is, and you see that from that graph, it's you have a very, very identical frequency response, no matter uh, the uh, impedance of those speaker, and you're really listening to the speaker. So if you connect different type of speaker, you really hear the difference be between speaker A and speaker B, because there is no coloration from the amplifier side. Uh, and and it is it is really, really interesting. So if you really, it's, it's a nice way sometimes to rediscover your speaker. Yeah, so basically, guys, this is a load invariant amplifier, which is the very best in class D these days. And I'm glad to see Marantz is embracing this now in these products because I've been testing a lot of class D amplifiers, the good ones. And this is one of the good modules, um, the Hypex one. And basically, the difference between this module that's in here versus the P10 is the P10 has a bridge tied load. So it uses two per channel, which gives you double the power. So the interesting thing I, I was telling you guys before is this Model 30 um, was like for $2,500 is giving you the same power output that you were getting from a Marantz PM11 S3 that was only about $4,500 just a few years ago. So in, in actuality, this is quite a value product. You're getting an amplifier that's more efficient because it's class D. It's load invariant. So in many ways, the amplifier section is better than what we saw in the PM11 S3, and it's cheaper. Hmm. Yeah, that's correct. So I would say, yeah, that that is it is a lot of value for the product. And I think there's been also, you know, a lot of progress that have been made around I would say uh, digital amplification. So I know that sometimes people may have a reaction of saying, oh, this is digital amplification. But you, as you mentioned, Gene, there's been so much progress uh, into class D amplification that is now at a level which is almost you know, impossible to notice any, any difference between a class D amplification, the way we do it, or what you're going to have in an AB class. It is something that France also has, if you go back to the history and the discussion, it was the same thing in the discussion with uh, Saul B. Marnes initially using tube amplifier and people asking him, hey, why do you still use tube amplifier and not going to the transistor? And he always answered the same thing of saying, hey, I don't believe transistor is at the level uh, to, to be used into, um, I would say, electronic for amplification today. And when the transistor were ready and, and prime time for uh, being high quality, then Marantz moved to the transistor. And uh, kind of the same thing with the Class D. Uh, initially, Class D was used mainly for the cost reason, and it was not really having the, that that hi-fi quality that people are looking for. But no, Class D, if you go for the higher model one and, and the good one, that's really at the level that it needs premium hi-fi. So it, it is why we're embracing those solutions now. Awesome. I like that. So I have to put you guys on the spot now that you're embracing class D on two of your products, two of your high end products. Are we looking in the future for having a multi-channel receiver 
like a newer receiver model that's going to have class D. I mean, it just makes sense when you're dealing with 11 or 13 channels and you could cook an egg on some of these receivers because they, <laughs> they idle so hot. They, that The problem with class AB is at low power, you're dissipating. You're only about 15 to 17% efficient when you're at low power. So by having class D, you're always, you know, in the eighties to 90% efficiency, even at low power, it just makes sense. Oh, I, I, I can take that one if you want. So uh, the answer is along the way, certainly, I would say that the prime of the uh, class D solution we're using, it is a really expensive solution yeah. uh, at the moment. So uh, if we put that directly into our AVR at the moment, it may go to a price point where people will say, wow, I don't get it any longer, but yes, it will have a lot of benefit. So as we continue to progress around, uh, I would say the design and what we can class D, I'm pretty sure it will happen at some time. Or maybe it makes sense for like a, a separate amplifier, a dedicated seven channel or eleven channel amplifier. That would be really killer. Some product that's ideas, where, guys. Yeah. That's probably <laughs> where you're gonna see it first, if you ask me. Yeah, but I'm not right. the AVR guy. I'm just the hi fi <laughs> system guy. Understood. Understood. So, so, so um, um, Emmanuel, how many models, amplifier models that utilize this? You have the. It's this model. Is it the the Ki and the PM? The Ki or? Ruby and the Model Thirty. Okay. And there is actually also a, a model in Europe, which is called the PM12, which is also available in Japan, which is also using. Uh, mm -hmm. Is that different than the P10? The PM10? Yeah, PM10. The, the, so the, the, the PM10 is the only one that, that uses four modules, which is fully balanced and used two per channel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's all the other ones have the same architecture. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Okay, is there any other question around the amplifier before we move on the uh, SACD play? Um, we could we could hit some of these questions um, towards the end, I guess, and just okay. go on. Yeah, okay. let's go to the, okay, so that that ends the presentation on the integrated amp. Let's, because uh, we're going to break this video up for easy digestibility. Mm -hmm. So now we're going to be talking about the integrated SACD player, the network player. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's go. So, so you want to throw a picture up on it? That'd be great. Well, actually, hold on here. We have to. He yes. didn't put a picture. <laughs> so, so actually, to oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. To complement that that two channel amplifier, we also wanted to make a, a product. And so you saw also in the in in the value in the proposition for the new brand, there's also the modern aspect of it. So it was important for us still to maintain that pure analog amplifier, not to mix digital and analog all together. But we wanted to make a complementary product there that will also embrace and um, bring, uh, I would say, to end user the ability of having access to any digital source available today. So we acknowledge the fact that the way to listen to the music today is, is has been changing really really fast and the availability of hd music and streaming of music is now fully embraced by people so we wanted to do that uh, that concept uh, I think the concept of that product to be really kind of the universal digital source player. And you can almost think of that product as a 16 one, right? So you're, you're going to see by looking into that, they, there's a lot of different product into that one box. So it starts at the center by a CD, SCCD drive, uh, because it, we believe it was still important to be able to have access to those uh, media. And there's still a lot of people out there that still probably own a lot of those CD and SACD, and they want a nice way to be able to listen back to those products. Uh, and we're using our own proprietary drive mechanism that uh, we manufacture ourselves, which is also able to play back DVD-ROM. So if you still want to burn uh, even DSD file or any type of high resolution file on a DVD ROM or CD ROM, uh, that the mechanism will be able to play that back. So it's probably not a lot of people still doing that, but there's still people that have those files on those media and want to be able to. But we wanted also to have much more, I would say, digital interface and option uh, to that product. So of course we had it a LAN connection and a Wi-Fi. A module into the product. There's also Bluetooth if you want to do that. And at the heart of the system, there is um, Sound United EOS platform. 
So EOS is you're probably familiar with it. It is the platform that will look at our Internet of Things platform, which basically give you three main features. Uh, the first one is the streaming capability and get access to uh, music from many, many different services. It is also the multi-room feature. So if you have any other EOS uh, product in your room, you can uh, do multi-room application. And there is also uh, the voice capability. So if you're using Siri or if you're using Alexa or Google Voice, you can control your music through your voice. Um, there is also a USB uh, B input. So you, there's basically a DAC uh, connectivity in that product. So you can connect that to your computer. So if you're a room uh, person or if you're having uh, your music on your computer, you can connect that to USB B. Put. There's digital in and uh, digital out to that product. Uh, there is a pretty unique solution for the DAC. Uh, we'll talk about that, which is something that we patented. Same thing. It is not new, but I just want to re-explain that. And there is also a, a, an amazing headphone amplifier in the SAC30N, which have a gain setting. So depending on the impedance of your headphone you have, you can really get the maximum out of that headphone amplifier. So. In a way, you can almost use that SACD30N as a computer DAC if you want with a pair of headphones. Uh, so you have that, that capability there. And there is a fixed and variable output also as well to the SACD30N. So if you want to connect that directly to a power amp, you can also as well uh, and control everything from the EOS app. So it is a really complete. So can I ask you a quick question? I, yes. I, from my personal computer system here, I have a four terabyte hard drive with a bunch of ISO files on it. Um, mm -hmm. Could I use J River and plug it directly in through USB um, into this player and get the files to that? Is that possible? Yes, it is possible. Yes, in that case, you will use the USB B input. So you connect your computer directly to that and you use the SACD 30N as your output device uh, and, and, and that's it. Yeah, so Gene, so in my house. about that, guys. Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. I was gonna say, yeah, in my house, I, that's how I have it. I have a, I'm use, I have a laptop that I can connect um, and use asynchronous DAC using um, J River, but I also have a a, a network um, because of the Heos um, um, module inside. It can jump on my network, go to my big one of those. I have one of those big Sony network high res music um, boxes. I can grab files from that or my media player. Um, DSD um, 192.24, um, just grab the app, go to the, uh, the, pick the server, and then send it to the player, and it plays. So use lots nice. of ways to get your files, mm -hmm. lots of ways. And I'm also thinking, too, if you put a product like this on a desktop in an office or something, and it has variable outputs, you can use a really high-quality active speaker, not exactly. have a preamp at all. Not, not to take the sale away from the Model 30 <laughs> integrated, but yeah. you could technically use it as a preamp to run a pair of active speakers. Oh yeah, absolutely. If you have all digital world, yeah. If you're not if you're not using any analog, pretty much all the digital connections you would need for music are on the back of this thing. They took Emmanuel and those guys took care of that. Nice. Yeah. So if you go back, so this is a picture of the back of the product. So but you're gonna see there's a lot of connection there. I also forget to mention there's an RS232. So if you also have, I don't know, any um CI system at home and you want to control it, this is also fully du doable either by the RS-232 or by the network through the EOS module also as well, mm -hmm. where we support a lot of protocol uh, also as well. So yeah, that product is really, really almost like a, I was mentioning before, a 16-in-1. So it, it can do pretty much anything. So you have to look at that as your a digital player and whatever you can think of, you're going to be able to for it. Uh, at the back of that unit and, and reproduce it in a way or in a... Um, <clears throat> so the next slide is just we mentioned about the DVD drive and talking also because uh, we are manufacturing that ourselves. So we we are in known for manufacturing a CD mechanism for a very long time and we continue to improve uh, in the same way generation after generation how we do that. Uh, it is also supporting, as I mentioned before, our CD-ROM. And what is in interesting also in the attention to detail, because we acknowledge the fact also that, oh, so, you know, when you discover the convenience, I will say, of streaming music or digital music, sometimes you may forget about your CD or an SACD a, a little bit. So uh, the Soundmaster already 
when he was listening to the product, came also with the request that basically when you're not using the CD or the SACD input, you just switch off the mechanism. So there is no possible noise from the uh, motor spinning or anything that could happen. Uh, and it completely switched off that uh, mechanism. And when you turn back the source input to be CD or SACD, or if you put the eject button, we actually reboot uh, the drive. So sometimes it takes a little bit of time, maybe three, four seconds before the tray open. Uh, and that's the reason why. It's because we just want to make sure that when it, it's not in use, uh, there is no interference that could happen, uh, even if there's a low risk there. Yeah. So attention to detail. And the next slide also, I wanted to touch base on the way we do the digital analog conversion. And, and this is unique to Maron City. It is, it is been a long time in the making and there's a couple of patents also associated uh, behind that way of doing it. So we call it the Maron's uh, Musical Mastering HD. So basically we take any PCM in input being coming from a CD, being coming from the streaming, coming from a NAS drive, coming from whatever platform you're using in the back. We apply a unique filtering there and we actually convert that signal to DSD-256 uh, bit stream. Uh, and we do it that way because we believe in, and in the measurement, we always believe that DSD have a little bit more of the musicality in the sound uh, that we believe is important for the brand. So we do that that way. And when you have that DSD-256 bit stream signal, we apply that to what we call the MMM conversion stage, which is where we have our pattern. And this is a direct one bit conversion to the analog uh, signal directly. Uh, which is kind of pretty unique. So people have a tendency always to ask, hey, hey what is the DAC you're using in that product? And, and it doesn't really matter at the end because the way we do it is really, really different than what you used to do. And of course, if you have a DSD input, then we go directly to the conversion stage. So, so I, have really, to, really I have unique. to ask you a quick question because I, I had this on my mind and somebody else came up with this too. And I think it's kind of an important thing to address here. Um, are you guys planning on offering a fully balanced model with XLR outputs, maybe a model 50 down the road? Is that something that's on the roadmap for Marantz? So uh, the, the, the short answer, and, and I want to, I don't want to put word in, in the mouth of Joel there, but there will be a replacement for the PM10. So the, the, the answer is, is, is probably yes. <laughs> I would say the short answer. So, so then you would have a source player that would, you would have a source player. I was that like, what is that? Well. <laughs> So. No, that's fine. That's fine. We said <laughs> earlier, I mean, we, we, we definitely have aspirations to take a lot of the things that we're doing here with the Model 30 and the SCD30 to bring it not only to higher price points and conceivably there's a way that we could bring this, bring this in even to a more further on down the road. Well, maybe many years to come, but we, we are actively trying to figure out what you just mentioned. Gotcha. Okay. We lost Phil for a second. I'm sorry. Phil. I'm back. Yeah. He's there. back. <laughs> Where'd he go? Where'd he go? I'm Where'd back. He go? I, I think in, in any, I think that was the last slide of my presentation. <laughs> so we, well, uh, one more was slide, a good time Emmanuel. To there's yes. One more slide. They're gonna one ask more. you. Right, let me put this back. You know, <laughs> um, the price. Ouch. Okay. The price. Well, yeah. So it's what twenty twenty four ninety nine for the model thirty and uh, twenty four ninety nine for the SA um, third uh, um, uh, SA CD thirty N. So you have the PM eight thousand, which is right below, um, right, Emmanuel, and then you yes, have this the model. Yes, the PM eight thousand six. And then you have this model, and then above that you would have something like your 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 um, your KI series, KI rubies, and yes. then above that you have your your PM ten, your PM series. So. So there's these are the finest that they make, and I mean, and it's it's beautiful. I mean, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> the last thing I believe, which is important to notice, there it's um, so we're bringing also in the U.S. the both finishes. If ask the mm -hmm. question, because that's always been the big question. Yeah. So we actually uh, bringing both the, uh, the the black finish and and the silver gold finish. Yes, which is nice because. Because every time I travel, that's one thing that everybody keeps asking me is when you guys gonna when are you gonna make the when can I get the silver one? When can I get the champagne? So now you have the ability to get the the um to have the um this color and that color. Ooh. And and I know we mentioned it earlier on, but I have to emphasize these are made in Japan out of mm -hmm. our Shirakawa audio work. So some of the best yep. craft people there that are making these products day in and day out. 
yes. So yes, somebody yes. wanted to know the dimensions of the network player. Uh, do you have? Do you know the uh, and the size the, and the weight of the of both products? Uh, someone asked about that. We'd, as we'd well. have to, we'd have to look at the we'd have to look at the specs. You man, you got the specs there? Yeah, I've got the spec there. So I was expecting the question, so I print out the spec sheet. So it's actually a, they are available on the website. So uh, so the dimension uh, it's yeah. I'll put it in the description. I'll put a link to the uh, to okay the, and the model thirty page um, after this yeah. video is done. Yeah, and the and, weight um, they are about thirty pound each unit. So the, the amplifier is a bit heavier. I think it's thirty two, yeah. and the SACD is twenty. Yes, yes. And I will say the headphone amplifier is um, um, preamp is out uh, amplifier is outstanding. I, um, the the headphones behind me are the 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 Denon uh, D ninety two hundreds, and um, it's it's outstanding on the on the SACD um, thirty. So what's the warranty at, and then how, what's the sales channel through this? You have a, a specific Marantz dealer. I mean, I don't imagine that's going to be sold online, right? What's the distribution, I guess? Yeah, our distribution is going to focus principally, I mean, in our core distribution specialty channel. That's really where we're going to be focused. And what about the warranty? How many years? Is it a one year, two year? Manny, what do we say? We have a five year warranty on these? Is that right? Uh, yeah, I think that's what, that, that's what we were planning on five years for those two. <laughs> that's awesome. Okay, so somebody has a question here. I think you might have answered this, but we'll put it up anyways sound differences between the ki ruby and the model 30 since the class d is the same or similar it's in the preamp section uh, so uh, i would say the the ki ruby which is also a, a much more expensive product uh, if you look at it was also specially tuned by uh, kenny shiwata as an anniversary product and using a very very high grade small production and selected part into uh, the Kiai Ruby. Uh, so it is it is a probably a little, a little bit higher, I would say, in, in terms of performance. And the sound signature is a little bit different because it was also tuned uh, by Ken Ishiwara. Uh, they're very similar, but the, the parts inside the Kiai Ruby are and of course, the, uh, the, constru the, the construction also of the, uh, the mechanical part, the Kiai Ruby is a copper plate uh, chassis and box where the Model 30 is not. Uh, so there's also a lot of different. Gotcha. And then someone's asking about the color finish on the black. Is it a gunmetal? Yeah, it's add to that. It's got a metallic um, quality to it, which is what they're picking up on in the light. So it, it is dark, it is black, but it has, so we spent a lot of time tuning that black. So it's a little warmer than the blacks we've seen before. So it's got a sort of like a, when the lights on it, it has a sort of more of a gold and metallic uh, reflectivity, okay, but it is yeah, definitely what black. Paul is confirming here as well. All right, looks good, guys. Um, geez, I'm kind of excited about this. If I wasn't moving, if I wasn't in the transition <laughs> of blue right now, I'd be requesting some of these to take a look at. You know, exactly. Just have to wait exactly. to move. Yeah, I'm the lucky one. I you walk in my house, I have a I have a seven foot tall f rack full of Marantz that I normally talk to you in, to in, to you in front of Gene, and now I have this in my office. So um, my wife is going to kick me out because I I have I'm going to have Marantz I'm going to have Marantz and and Cyanide products everywhere. I mean, she's going to trip over them in the bathroom <laughs> if that's necessary because I want one of everything if I possibly can get it. Absolutely. We're going to have to live vicariously through <laughs> Phil here. <laughs> I got the best job, man. I just asked Joel and Emmanuel for products and they say, and they say, yeah, you can, you can, you can borrow it. And I just try to keep it forever. <laughs> yeah. I, I know when difficult time, I think it's complicated, but I really encourage everybody if they, there's a chance. So unfortunately there's no CD at this year. There's no, no show. There's no real place yet where you can listen to those products, but I really encourage them to, to have that experience and, and, and really, I think sitting in front of a, a mount amplification amplifier and listening to uh, even sometimes the spe speaker you may already know, you may re discover something new and something which is pretty unique to the brand. So I really encourage people to try that. So I'm kind of curious and from a Sound United perspective, um, what speakers do you recommend with this series? Would you do like a Definitive Tech D15 or do you think the Polk L800s would be a good match? Because with with the Polk L800s, you don't want a balanced amplifier because of the SDA technology needs a ground reference. So, and this is rated at 200 watts in the forums. Do you think that would be a good enough amp to drive a pair of L800s? 
I would say, so you, you already touched on it or whatever, so I may not recommend the SDA solution for that, but all the rest of the Legend range is, is a really nice match for those products. And the same thing also with the D15 or the D17, you have a really, really good match. And it, it is interesting because they really, really sound different in a way uh, at the end. So it's also a matter of taste, I would say. Uh, but there's, um, I personally have a preference for the D17, but it's personal. Yeah, so. yeah that's... That's I would do. I'd love to have a pair of D17s with this. Right now, this is a a pair of Legend L200s, and people are shocked at the base response and the dynamics that are coming out of those bookshelves with this system. So it actually does a big a bigger point of proving itself uh, with from the amount of output and power and dynamics that are coming from a, from a bookshelf. People are just like, wow, what would it sound like if you had a pair of floor standers? I would probably my wife would probably kick me out of the house, but. And those aren't very efficient speakers, so the, if, to be able to power those um, with that much authority speaks mm -hmm. volumes for the amplifier. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. All right, guys. Well, I think we're wrapped up. Um, what I would like to put you on the hook for is if anybody has questions after the broadcast is done, maybe you could pop by you know, in a day or two and just answer some questions. I'll send you the link to this thread. Mm -hmm. um, I appreciate you guys all being here. There's a lot of people here uh, putting this presentation together. Phil, thanks for um, hosting it. And um, these products look awesome. I'm looking forward to seeing the new direction that Marantz is heading with this. I like the cosmetics. I like kind of the architecture, what you're doing. I'm kind of waiting for the more powerful models myself because I just love power. <laughs> so I'm waiting yeah. for like the 400 watt one. Yeah. Hey, but um, you know, hey Gene, there's one question that I think we could we could probably answer because people we always talk about tuning and there's a question about shouldn't all amplifiers sound the same? And I have oh, yeah. worked for multiple companies, and I will tell you for a fact they don't. There's so many other factors, yep. whether it's dampening, dampening factor, the the preamp stages, and everything else. So they may measure plus or minus three dB, but but one may be up here and one may be down there, and they all have their own specific characteristics. So so at this level, we always encourage people to listen. It isn't about the spec on the box; yeah. it's the way it's about the way it sounds. Yeah, yeah and I use me I use measurements to see if there's really a problem with a product. I mean, I actually did a video a few months ago where we we had an amplifier that was very badly measured, and it was it was messing up the frequency response of the speakers because it couldn't handle low impedance loads. It was a very reactive amplifier. Mm -hmm. So an amplifier like this one, where you showed that graph where the impedance, the frequency response remains the same regardless of the load it drives. Mm -hmm. In those cases, those amplifiers should sound more similar than they do differently. So mm -hmm. it really depends on a lot of things. Like you said, damping factor is related to output impedance. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So, so yeah, they were, you so they do sound measure. different. You got to know what to measure. Yeah, exactly. So every amp, so there's, so that's why each brand has their own characteristics because each, each, each um, sound, each engineering team and each sound master is trying to, um, is looking for a specific sound that they are accustomed to or that they desire. So even if on paper, they may look the same. Um, every amplifier, every brand has their own kind of signature. Same way with every speaker. Right. Every speaker is measured plus or minus three dB, and I guarantee you, not every speaker sounds the same. So, and that's the same thing with oh, amplifiers. Speakers are a whole different animal. <laughs> a whole other animal. <laughs> whole animal. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so I just well, wanted to answer awesome. that. I appreciate I saw that. <laughs> Yeah, that was that was good. I was gonna like throw that up there, but I figured that would open a Pandora's box. But you handled that pretty well. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Okay. All right, guys. Well, you know, I'm gonna put this PowerPoint presentation on our Patreon channel. So if anybody on our Patreon that wants to download this, that's that's gonna be readily available. You can kind of look at it. I want to look more at that picture of the of the audiophile Scarface. That just to me that was like <laughs> the whole the whole presentation. That is the, <laughs> that just is the most awesome picture, audiophile star. That's the that's the quote that's the quote of the of the of the train of the uh of the session yeah definitely you should send him that and let him know that's what, that's what they call him in the u.s i think he'd probably get a kick out of it <laughs> where is that where is he where is he where is he we got to say goodbye with the with the uh, with the with scarface yeah we gotta put that as a, <laughs> hold on let me let me share that <laughs> I mean that's just killer right there. What do you find, Scarface? <laughs> All right, that's awesome. All right, thanks guys. For well, us, thanks Gene. for joining. Yeah, thanks Thank for joining you, us. All right, Thank take you care. Well, we had thanks a great time, and until next time, my friends, keep listening.
拜。